session now. This is the regular board meeting of the Ukiah Unified School District Board of Trustees. And we are going to um, start with a flag salute, but before we do that, Trustee Keplinger would like to pay tribute to a hero with connections in Ukiah Unified. Trustee Keplinger, you wanna explain? Um, I just wanted to bring the attention to the board and to our community um, and pay respect on Monday, um, April 1st, um, the last remaining survivor of uh, Pearl Harbor, Lou Contour, passed away. Um, he has ties to the Ukai community. His granddaughter uh, works at Kelpella, and he has uh, currently has four great grandchildren who go to Ukai Unified. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention, and maybe we can think about that as we say the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Thank you. Can you lead us, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Trustee Kumbhinger, for bringing our attention to that. Um, a report out from closed session. I might need some help here. I can do it. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Cuban. Regarding item B3, it was moved by Fernandez, seconded by Keplinger to approve the Compromise and Re Release Agreement, Office of Administrative Hearings, case number 2024020045. Um, it was approved to a six to zero roll call vote. And that is all. Okay. Um, before we, before I entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda, we do have one public comment on the consent agenda. Mr. Sherman. Good evening. So it's a little bit odd coming up for public comment. <laughs> Um, the reason being we have a item on the consent agenda that we wanted to uh, spend a moment to speak to. So that's the COR1 change order one for the OKO uh, elementary TKK uh, classroom improvement project. And the reason I wanted to speak to it is just to call out that this is a deductive change order. Um, typically change orders go the other way. This one is actually um, bringing money back into our, uh, or, or coming, bringing out of that project, so it'll free up funds for additional projects out of Measure A, and the total change order is, uh, I believe, 546,000, so uh, it's a substantial chunk that we'll be getting back, yeah, so. Um, I, I think in the future, we'll try to make sure we get these um, onto the agenda instead of the consent, so we don't have to speak to them. That's it, any Great. questions? Thank you. No, All it right. is very I guess rare. Public comment, so you can't <laughs> see it's H twenty six. It's the um, the TK, the UKO TKK classrooms ended up being five hundred thousand dollars less than we had anticipated. Nice work. Yeah, correct. It doesn't Thank normally you. go that what direction in construction projects. So wonderful. Okay, um, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Wait, yeah. I move to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Um, I'm sorry, I just got distracted. Let me finish this one and then I'll go back for a second. So who made the motion? Trustee Fernandez? I'll second. Second it, Keplinger. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right. I think I forgot to make a motion to approve the agenda. So can we also <laughs> approve the agenda? Move to approve the agenda. Thank you, Trustee Fernandez. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Trustee Johnson. Okay, all those in favor of the agenda as presented? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, you got that right, Debbie, I'm good? Okay, um, our next agenda item is acceptance of donations. Um, I did note a, a number of donations in support of the Redwood Valley Outdoor Ed Project. We really appreciate that support. Um, can I have a motion to accept our donations? I'd like to make a motion <laughs> to accept the donations. Thank you. Gratitude. Uh, second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you to our donors. Um, item C7, student advisor report. Olivia, let us know what's going on. All right, well, first of all, good evening, everyone. 
Um, sorry, I've been a little sick, so if I sound <laughs> a little off, that's what's wrong. Um, once again, Ukiah High will be hosting Midnight Madness on April 19th. It is a 3v3 basketball tournament, and teams consist of students, teachers, staff, and coaches. Prom is just two weekends away on April 27th. Prom will be held at Red Barn, and this year's theme is Enchanted Forest. Planning for graduation has officially begun with our first grad committee meeting at lunch tomorrow, so... Graduation is coming. <laughs> I'm excited to announce, based off our last month's board meeting with the uncertainty regarding Clubs Day, we will still be having one last Clubs Day for the school year on May 31st. The new guidelines will not be placed until next school year. And then finally, our Ukiah High Golden Cats dance team will be performing tomorrow night, the 12th, at 7 p.m. in the cafeteria, and admissions are free. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Olivia, any questions or comments? All right, thanks so much. Lots of fun stuff happening. Um, okay, item C8, employee organizations. I don't know if anyone from CSEA, oh, sorry. UTA. No, UTA. UTA, okay, so just I'm just checking. No one from CSEA is here? Okay, we'll go on to UTA. Good evening. Um, my name is Jensen Henderson. I'm the secretary on the board of UTA, and at this time, I have nothing to report. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> We'll move along. All right. <laughs> so next uh, um, agenda item is leadership team report. Kita Grinberg from Big Picture at South Valley High School. Good evening, trustees. Um, first of all, this is my, my name is Kita Grinberg. I've met most of you. Um, I'm principal of Big Picture Ukiah at South Valley. And since this is my first time in this role addressing all of you, I want to start by saying thank you for the opportunity to lead our amazing school and to serve our community in this way. It's been an awesome and intense first year so far and I'm already very excited for next year. Um, so, I have a button. Just to report out on our leadership team, um, this last year we've done a lot of really good work. I think one of the biggest accomplishments is really formulating our new strategic plan and the LCAP, which I'm sure you've been hearing some about. But what I've been most impressed with is the amount of stakeholder input we've had and getting to be in rooms with students and teachers and community members and parents and all the different committees who've been giving in input, both on the big ideas and the vision and the mission, all the way down to wordsmithing some of the goals and the metrics. Um, so I think that's close to being done. So that's a huge project. Um, and also, we continue our CAPS network um, work, which is really around our professional learning communities. And that's you know with principals and school leaders and teachers, each leading the professional learning teams at their school. We've had an amazing consultant this year, Dr. Luis Cruz, who's come and done a lot of sessions with us, um, developing the rigor of our PLCs. And we're getting excited for next year, having some other folks coming in and really diving into feedback, grading practices, and assessment. And I think another aspect of being on the leadership team is getting to participate in learning rounds, which as principals, we visit each other's schools and get to give each other feedback and walk through the classrooms and look at teaching and learning and school culture, ask each other challenging questions, give each other feedback. And I've really enjoyed getting to develop that camaraderie with the other school leaders and help each other grow our schools. So that's my quick update from the leadership team. Um, and now we're going to tell you a little bit about our school, and I brought students because who better to tell you than them? So I'll let I'll turn it over to them, starting um, with talking about our academic program. Hello, my name is Dakota. I'm a senior at South Valley. Um, I'm going to be talking about our academic program. So. We have an individualized curriculum, so we have one advisor, and we have one-on-one -on -one meetings with our adv advisors, and that just helps the teacher really get to form that relationship with their student and really get to know their personal interest. Um, we have learning goals, and these are our, well, your usual traditional subjects would be so social studies and math, but ours are learning goals, and we have six of them, and we put those with our work. Um, we have like social reasoning, quantitative reasoning, knowing how to learn, 
Um, and then our exhibitions, uh, at the end of the semester, we put together a portfolio of all of our work, and then we present that to one of Okita, our principal, and then any family members that want to join, just to give ourselves credit and not forget about all the hard work we've done. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Isaiah Vargas. I am a senior at Big Picture South Valley. Um, so I'm going to talk about our Leaving to Learns. Our Leaving to Learns, these are our field trips that we go on, and these are usually around town. These are based on job sites where students get to go and see firsthand if they're interested in it, they get to pursue it and maybe intern there as well. Um, our student-led groups, these are our student groups on campus. These are usually based around a student's hobby or passion where they get to bring it on campus, such as my student-led group. I lead a PE and a boxing group where I get to bring boxing on a campus and I get to teach other students as well. Um, our community partnerships, these are more like our internships and people in the community that come on the campus and get to share their, um, their job and stuff like that. And uh, other community partnerships are just people in the community that get to come to our school and like teach lessons and lead lessons like that. Thank you. Hello, my, my name is Daisy today. How do I do it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. My name is Daisy today. I'm a senior at South Valley Big Picture Ukiah, and I'm gonna be talking to you guys about our internships. And on the screens, you could see our internship plan data. Um, what we do in internships is we have real world learning experiences. So we get to go out into the world and find something we're interested in and work in that field. We have people working in education, cosmetology, construction, agriculture, sports and recre recreation. And I personally were an uh, intern at the high school with Rosie at the front desk and I'm helping her do whatever she needs. I answer phone calls and she's just showing me how to do all that thing, all those things. and. I can hopefully pursue a career in the same thing. And we have all different types of ways like students can learn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then school culture and climate. So we are a very community-based school. We have, every Monday we have pick-me-ups. So we spend 10 minutes the entire school playing games and getting to know one another. Um, everyone knows each other because we found ways to like include one another in every little thing. We have kids like Isaiah who have his student group. We have people running other student groups like pottery and we just have such a healthy environment and we have resources for us to grow and get better. We have mindfulness, we have counselors, we have substance counselors, we have different ways like of art, we have yoga and it's just a very one-on-one -on -one school. We Um, yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so our student leadership, I'm actually a part of that, and we organize events for students as like motivation for the students, I guess. I know at the beginning of the year, we did like a door decorating competition. We have attendance incentives too for that, so the students just kind of put together stuff that other students would be interested in. And then, uh, students have a voice, so the student-led groups, if you're really interested in something, you just really have to speak up and say that, and somebody will provide you with the stuff to do what you want, have a desire to do, I would say. And then culture of self-discovery. Our school is constantly pushing us to go out and experience our community and really see what our community has to offer, so that itself is definitely self-discovery. Thank you again. With that being said, we want to thank you guys for allowing us to come here and, and share a little bit about Big Picture South Valley. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to ask. And we'd like to invite you guys to our graduation on June 4th at 6? 6.30 p.m. Uh, thank you. It's wonderful. Can I um, thank you so much, but I think there are probably some questions. Um, any questions from the board? Yeah. Trustee Arkin? I'm sorry I don't have a question. I, what I have is... Uh, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. I want to say that I'm so proud of what has happened at South Valley. I like the unity. It's become a school of all of you, not just individual uh, kids going all over the place, not knowing each other, but through little by little by little, it has been a, 
a wonderful success story that you guys have continued, and I'm just very proud of you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you, Trustee Arkin. I also just want to add, so these slides, I didn't make the bullet points and ask the students to speak to it. I asked them what should be on the slide, so I just want to say that this is truly their take on it. Can, that. can I ask a, a couple of questions? Um, I'm curious for Dakota and Isaiah what your internships are, if you're doing them. It, you can just okay. tell, it doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> no judgment. Okay. So um, I had an internship at the Arbor. Mm. It's a youth resource center. Mm -hmm. So I was a part of the RJYC program, and it's a way to take students take ki children out of the prison pipeline. So it's basically like probation. Mm -hmm. They come and do a course with us, and then at the end, it's wiped off of the record. And then I actually recently graduated, so early. So I'm not at that awesome. internship anymore. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. My, my internship is uh, MMA, mixed martial arts. And so I get to go to the MMA gym, and I just get to learn everything there, kickboxing, Muay Thai, Jiu-Jitsu, everything. So that's what I get to do there. Do you want to be a teacher of? Um, I compete right now as an amateur kickboxer, but I would love to start maybe my own gym or something like that in the future. But right now, it's South Valley. We're building a, a little community there as well with the boxing group going on. So that's just a start. That's awesome. And my last question: You, where you said the leaving to leaving to uh, something? The leaving to learn. Leaving to learn. Where you said you go around town? What are the oh, places? Oh, so these are like. Um, I know Keita would know a little more than me, but leaving to learns are like, um, for instance, to the fire station where mm -hmm. if you want to become a firefighter, we could we get to go there for a few hours and you get to learn what they're doing throughout the day, like a day in the life. And um, LTL is like, um, where was the pipeline? Dakota yeah, Dakota can add something. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. um, I really used this part of their curriculum to my advantage when I first came, and I went on a culinary tour at SRJC. I went to a donkey sanctuary, it's mm -hmm. donkey therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's actually where I found my internship was a leaving to learn at the Arbor. I didn't know that our community had that to provide for us. So just not even just in our community, there's a lot out of our community too as well. And they're usually fun. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, and I, I know this is probably out of turn, and I'm, I'm going to say it anyway, but um, South Valley is my favorite Ukiah Unified School. I know that's not fair, but it really is. So thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you for sharing tonight. It is so special for us to have students give a presentation, so we really appreciate yeah, it. And you were all very well spoken. Super poised. Well -spoken. Better than many adults. Well done. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, we are on item 10 for public comment for um, items not on the agenda, and I don't think we have any. Is that correct? Yes. I did tell our South Valley team that they, it's not rude at all if yeah. you need to leave, so um, you're welcome to stay, but certainly don't feel like you need to stay. Don't feel obligated. No public comment for items not on the agenda? Okay. Um, so we're on item D1, Citizens Bond Oversight Committee Measure A Annual Report. Thank you, Steve. For D2. Okay. All right, good evening. Unfortunately, you don't have to listen to me for very long on this one, but um, way back in March of 2020, which seems like, I don't know, a couple decades ago at this point, the voters in our attendance area passed Measure A, which gives us up to 75 million in facilities bonds to spend on our school sites. And as you know, we've been spending that money fast and furious on a lot of great projects. It's called a Proposition 39 bond, meaning that 55% of the voters had to approve it, and we did that, plus just a little bit more. Um, but one of the requirements is that we have what's called the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. It's a group of volunteers, and as you know, we struggled to fill this committee last fall. It took us a little bit of time, but uh, it is kind of a strange commitment that you come to one or two meetings a year, and you get to kind of listen, and then one of you is lucky enough to come talk to the board once a year, and Carolyn did that a couple years ago before she joined this board. Um, it is. So a huge thank you to our three existing uh, long-term members of the committee and to our four new members. We could not have possibly, we can't do this without them, so, uh, so a huge thanks. And one of our new members is here tonight. She's had a busy 10 days. She had her first meeting last Monday, was selected as committee chairperson, and was selected to come talk to the board. So uh, 
So it, it's been a quick, quick adventure for, for Emily Summers. So I'm gonna turn it over to Emily and let her give you the annual update. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, okay, this is, got it. Okay, um, thank you for having me tonight. I'm happy to be on this committee. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a couple of slides and try not to read them and be boring, but that's kind of what I'm here to do. So uh, here we go. These are the committee members as of June 30th to 2023, and you can see the first three members um, are the only members that were on the board, and they are serving out their sentence this following, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. Uh, okay, um, serving out their terms. Um, <laughs> so if we go to the next slide, you can see that those three are still there. I think um, Claudia and David and Heath all will finish in August of this year. Okay, yeah. So um, they'll term out, but we're not having our first meeting till October, so then hopefully um, we'll have some new people to join at that time. And then you can see um, after those three, these are the new members that we have on our board. Um, and I am lucky enough to be chairperson of this board. Um, I got here because I'm the PTO president and Grace Hudson. So um, it's easy for me to get up and do stuff like this. Okay, the purpose of this committee. The purpose of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee is to allow the community to audit the use of bond revenue. Duties include, so informing the public. The committee shall inform the public concerning the district's expenditure of bond proceeds, review expenditures. The committee shall review expenditure reports produced by the district to ensure that A, bond proceeds were expended only for the purposes set forth in Measure A, and B, no bond proceeds have been used for teacher or administrative salaries or other operating expenses. And then the annual report, at least one time annually commencing with the end of the first fiscal year in which any bond proceeds were expended and continuing through the end of the fiscal year in which bond proceeds have been spent in full. The committee shall prepare an annual written report. So the purpose of this to inform the public, I've actually talked to several community members about this, which has been kind of cool, and that's why I was interested in serving because I wanna know how the money's being spent. So I was able to kinda talk about it with community members, so I am doing my job. Okay, next slide, meetings. Uh, on April 2nd, we met for the first time for me and then, you know, not the first time for several of the other board members. We toured the new TKK classrooms at Yokale Elementary School. Uh, we reviewed the current and upcoming projects. We reviewed the final 2022-23 expenditures, as well as the audit report, and their audit report was great, so we didn't really have to look through that. Reviewed member terms and elected a new chairperson and vice chairperson. Discussed the annual report. Uh, and future meetings are tentatively scheduled for October 7th and March 10th of 2025. So Measure A projects, we've been busy, as you can see, which is pretty cool. Um, the major projects that have been completed, uh, Eagle Peak had HVAC replacement, paving projects, Nokomis got HVAC and roof replacement, Pomelita Gym HVAC replacement, uh, the soccer field, which was awesome, uh, Yokeo roofing at HVAC replacement, Oak Manor HVAC and roof replacement, secondary fencing and site work project, and Yokeo paving project. And then you can see the major projects nearing completion are the Nokomis, Yokeo, Oak Manor, TKK classrooms and fencing, and those should be wrapping up right now, essentially. Um, the major projects breaking ground in June will be Calpella's TKK classrooms and fencing, Grace Hudson's TKK classrooms and fencing, and Frank Zeke's TK classrooms and fencing. Here are some pictures of the work that's been done at Yokeo. Um, and this is the play yard 
And we actually had our meeting in that little room that you can see on the bottom right. And it's a beautiful classroom. It was a lot of light and it felt really awesome. And I wish that I was a teacher in that classroom. <laughs> None of the classrooms I was a teacher in looked like that. Um, and then we have Oak Manor, again, Yokeo, and Nokomis. And this is kind of what the buildings will look like at our new sites, Calpella and Grace Hudson and Frank Zeke. So the fund balance, June, as of June 30th, 2023, beginning fund balance 7-1-2022 was 12 million. Six hundred forty-eight thousand five hundred twenty-six and seven cents. Do you guys want me to read every single thank you? <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. So I appreciate that. With the ending fund balance of thirty million four hundred forty-five thousand eight hundred ninety-seven and fifty-nine cents. <laughs> In summary, the results indicate that Ukiah Unified School District has properly accounted for the expenditures held in the building fund. Measure A election of 2020, and that such expenditures were made for authorized bond projects. And I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank Does you so much, Emily. Appreciate it. Oh, and, you're welcome. Um, let you can stay there because there might be some questions from the board. Are there? If you don't mind. No, we all good. Yeah. Everyone feels comfortable with the report. Um, I had a question. It's not for you actually. I and maybe this already happened, but um, could could it? Could we schedule a time for the board members to see the TK classrooms? Did that already happen? We're working on it. Oh, okay. We um, talked about this. And actually, we're going to do a ribbon cutting ceremony, and we'll we'll probably do that all at once. The board oh. will be invited to those ribbon cutting ceremonies. We just have to set the dates. When are we cutting ribbons? Soon. Okay. I, can I mean, we I can get really big scissors really for the ribbon yes. cutting? Oh, okay, yeah. that yes. would be cool. Okay, wonderful. Yes. I'd, I'd love to see them because I can see they look really beautiful. Can they I say are one beautiful. Thing, Megan? Sure. I just want to thank Emily for <laughs> for coming in so quickly and ready to do this. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is this is the stuff I was made to do. So right. I'm happy Good. to be here, All and right. I'm gonna take Deb's advice and step out of the meeting. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, can can I have a motion to accept the annual report? I'd like to make a motion to accept the report. Thank you, Trustee Keplinger, seconded by? I second it. Trustee Orozco, thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed and abstentions? Great, thank you. Okay, um, we're, we're heading into item D2 and three. I'm going to first go through what I think the flow of this item is and correct me if I'm wrong. So my understanding is we're going to open the public hearing on this item, there will be a presentation, by Steve and perhaps some uh, helpful attorneys that are here. Then we will accept public comment. Then the board will discuss. <coughs> then I'm going to close the public hearing. And then the item that we vote on is the following one. Is that? Sounds I got perfect. It? OK. Great. So I'm going to open the public hearing. Is that what I'm doing first? Sure. OK. I'm banging that. And the, open, the public hearing is now open for resolution number 25, 2023-2024, a public hearing to receive and consider public comments authorizing submittal of a surplus property waiver application to the State Board of Education for 700 East School Way in Redwood Valley. Great, and once again, I don't have to talk for very long, which is a good thing for all of us. Uh, we have two amazing folks here from Orbach, Huff, and Henderson tonight. Tempest Garland, who's been here once before with us. And tonight we have Serene Abrihamian, who's going to walk you through a brief presentation, and we'll, then we'll go from there. Okay, okay. thank you. Great. Thank you. Good evening, thank you for having me tonight and thank you for that introduction, Steve. I'm Serena Abrahamian. Okay, so uh, as Steve said, I'm gonna be walking through the steps that have been taken to dispose of or sell the Redwood Valley Elementary School site um, to date. And of course, our recommended next steps around seeking a waiver from the State Board of Education. And just by way of background, of course, we're talking about 700 East School Way, um, and you have the address there. The lot size is about 12.4 acres, 
uh, and you see the county zoning designation as public facility, which of course, as you know, many uh, institutional or publicly owned facilities are designated with that zoning code. It's comprised of two uh, legal parcels and you have the assessor parcel numbers identified there. The district has engaged in a very robust process around this property and it's uh, work that it's done to seek input from the community and community representatives around the next best steps for the site. So of course on this slide you see that there were two committees formed of what we call a 711 committee or under the education code known as an asset management advisory committee. 711 is shorthand because and I like this part of the presentation because it's a committee, it's a Brown Act committee comprised of between seven and 11 community members, similar to what you just heard with regard to the CBOC or the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Under the education code, there are certain community groups that have to be represented on that committee. And of course, both your committees met those requirements uh, as outlined in the education code. The first committee was formed in 2008 and advised that the school be closed at the end of the 2009-2010 school year, which of course occurred. A second 711 or asset management committee was formed in December of 2016, and this is common that you would form two committees, one to advise on closure. Sometimes uh, closure uh, recommendation is given and then almost immediately there is uh, further work done to advise on next steps relating to the property and sometimes se separate committees are formed to advise on that. And the second committee was formed in December of 2016 and further advised regarding uh, what should occur with the property. And so we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the work that that committee did. Of course, what you see here in bullets one and two are pulled directly from the education code. So the citations are listed there, 17387 at SEC is where you would find uh, what the committee's role is. Um, importantly, the job of the committee is to make a recommendation to the board and for the board to then consider the recommendation and take the next steps if it determines that surplusing, which is what the committee would be advising on as one of the items, is an appropriate next step. So of course here the committee met five times between February 23 and December 7, 2017 to consider potential options for the use or disposition of the property. Um, and on April 19, 2017, importantly held what is an important component of this process because again, this is a committee that is formed by the board and the uh, meetings occur pursuant to the Brown Act. So the public is invited to every single meeting just like your board meetings and to provide input. Uh, an important component of the 7-Eleven process is that there's also a separate public hearing aspect to it. So of course, the public hearing is advertised. So in addition to the, to the public being invited to every meeting to make public comment, there's actually a public hearing that occurs on what should happen next with this property. So the committee uh, designates certain uh, potential options and the community has an opportunity to provide input on those options. Uh, and all of this is to develop a recommendation report. So the recommendation report here was developed and approved on December 7, 2017, and it was presented to the board on December 14, 2017. So after the 7-Eleven committee completes its part of the process, which is again, is typically after they submit the, the recommendation report, their work relating to that site is typically completed. Then there are three steps that the board can take. Uh, if it deems and, and decides that it's an appropriate next step to take the recommendation from the committee and deem the property surplus, and surplusing means that if a property is deemed surplus, the board, it can be sold or long-term leased for up to 99 years. That is why typically you would move through and, and uh, potentially begin a surplus process. And in order for that to occur, the board has to declare the property surplus by resolution. Here that occurred on October 13, 2022. I'm sorry, on December 14, 2017, the board accepted the committee's recommendation and on October 13, 2022, deemed the property surplus. 
Step two of the surplus process, so again, there are three steps under the education code. The first step is for the board to deem the property surplus. The second step is a public offering process where local public agencies receive notice that the property is available for, and it's what, however the board designates it, either sale or long-term lease or both, and they have an opportunity, it's almost a right of first refusal, to, it's an easier way to think about it, here, there was one uh, priority entity, we'll call them a priority entity, that expressed interest, but as negotiations occurred or as they provided their proposal, uh, next steps weren't taken relating to that particular priority entity and you know, for, for reasons that maybe Steve can speak to. But if uh, it is not sold or long-term leased to a, a public entity under the public offering statutes, uh, then you move to what's called a formal bidding procedure which of course, uh, under this part of the statute, uh, the district has to give notice pursuant to, it's a two resolution process. In resolution one, uh, essentially announcing that the property is available for and is gonna be subjected to a public bidding process or a formal bidding process. And a second resolution where, of course, that public bidding or that process occurs. The board engaged in two formal bidding processes. So one occurred um, on August 10, and one occurred on January 18, 2024, and there were no bids submitted at either of those uh, meetings. Um, so as a next step in the process, because now we've discussed the three steps uh, under the Education Code for surplusing, um, in, and because the district has made a, a really strong attempt here with two separate formal bidding procedures to sell the property under the education code statutes. What we'd be asking the State Board of Education to authorize is a waiver of the portion of the education code that requires formal bidding. Because you've done this now two times, which is a lot, <laughs> um, and it, as you saw, it takes quite a few steps to, to actually engage in that process. The State Board of Education uh, receives an application, and in the application it explains which statutes the district seeks waiver of, and in this case, of course, it would be the formal bidding procedures, and what the request would be is for the district essentially to be able to put the property out on the open market, and before doing that, of course, consider what the next best steps are, but to have the flexibility to do that and not be constrained by the formal bidding procedures under the education code. So essentially, it's like you, just like if you were to list your house for sale, what are the steps you would take for that? Uh, the State Board of Education would give you the flexibility by granting the waiver. And uh, in terms of the process for the State Board of Education meetings and application process, as I said, an application would be submitted to the State Board of Education. You see there that there are two meeting dates coming up, uh, July 10 or 11 or September 11 or 12. We, we just heard from our State Board of Education contact that we actually uh, just missed the, the deadline for submitting for July 10 and 11, and th those deadlines often change depending on how many applications they're getting just across the board about various topics. And so our next opportunity would be the, for the September 11 uh, to 12 meeting. Um, and of course, we have to submit that application uh, within the next uh, month and a half or so in order to make that September 11 meeting. Um, and then of course, if the uh, State Board of Education approves the waiver application, then steps would be taken to, uh, of course, based on uh, the board's direction for next steps relating to uh, sale of the property in this case. And a part of that might include, for example, uh, issuing a request for qualifications and proposal to seek uh, a brokerage advice or uh, retain a broker to advise on the next best steps about valuation, highest and best use for the site, and marketing opportunities in order to for the district to be able to take the steps of listing it on the open market if that's what the board deems appropriate. And that's the presentation. Um, I'll open it up for questions now. So are there any clarifying questions from the board before um, we move to public comment? We'll have time to comment as well, but right now would be for just clarifying questions on the presentation. Trustee Arkin? Uh, when you said we, um, we should 
do it for September 11th or 12th. <laughs> that's the next one. Uh, and you said, uh, uh, does it automatically have to be done with a broker? No. Okay. So the district would have to go through a procurement process, a separate procurement process to retain a broker. That's a process in and of itself. Okay. So that would be a request for qualifications and proposal okay. that gets issued. Brokers respond. The district assesses whether it wants to hire a broker. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But so we, there are multiple steps to that. To, and or there could be other ways that we might suggest that, and we see if we okay. Correct. Be done. That's you. just one of the suggested yes, next thank steps. You. So just, just to be clear, the, the waiver allows us the permission to hire a broker, but the, <laughs> the choice about how to handle this still lies with us. Uh, you could have hired a broker even for the formal bidding procedure, but because you're going to be listing the property on the open market if the waiver is granted, and that's what the board fi uh, finds as the appropriate next step, in order for, to get some help around marketing it, that would be the broker's role. Okay. Um, Trustee Johnson? Okay, j just so I'm clear, if the waiver is accepted by the state, we don't have to go through a broker. If we had a group of people that wished to purchase a property, we could sell to them? Correct. So really what it does is it just uh, gives the district flexibility and t brings you out of that formal bidding process because that, you know, as we talked about the three steps for surplusing, you've been kind of caught up in that third step. So this just gives you the flexibility to explore other options. Tra do you have a question? I'm sorry, uh, Trustee Keplinger and then Fernandez. Just quickly, I know that sometimes um, the biggest issue is time. Yes. And so if we're looking at realistically them just looking at our proposal on the 11th or 12th, what realistically is the turnaround time to even receive an answer from them? Oh, no, they'll approve it during that. So oh, we don't know exactly so which day will be agendized for the 11th or the 12th, but they'll, they'll make a decision then. And then, yes, we receive input back from the State Board of Education with the parameters around how we take the next steps around potentially listing it and what the board, board's actions would be around that. Okay. So they, they provide some direction. Trustee Fernandez? So, so if we didn't do this waiver process, our only other option would be another round of formal bidding. Yes. So either we do formal bidding again or we do this. Those Correct. are basically the two, the two choices we have. Yes, because the board has already deemed the property surplus to its needs. So now you're in this three-step right. process, right? So you get, you're either going to continue to be in the formal bidding procedure step or move on to the waiver process. Okay, Which just to be super clear, we've done twice with no bids. You've done twice <laughs> okay. and you've engaged in a very, very robust <laughs> process. We kept waiting and no yes. one came. Okay. Um, still clarifying questions. Trustee Arkin? Yes. Okay. So if, uh, what is the likelihood of uh, it being accepted on a waiver? Um, we've done very many of these recently just because as you yes, see, yes. and as you can imagine, many districts are looking for potential ways to, to, uh, to get rid of the bring property. in revenue. Um, and the State Board of Education has been granting them, yeah, to give districts this very flexibility. Great. Thank you. So I had, I had one question. Um, the rules around surplus property, it sounded like we could sell it or lease for 99 years. Are those, there was another thought. Did you have a third option there, or was it only those two? exchange, which we also went down that road and had, so just for the benefit of reminding the board and the public, we spent a lot of time on, a, on an exchange concept that didn't pan out either. But in the lease one, what happens if you lease to an, an organization and they kind of get tired of it before 99 years? What happens then? Yeah, we would be really precise in the lease agreement itself about uh, exit provisions and, of course, the length of the of the lease and if they wanted to terminate early, what the procedures for that would be and if there's a payout requirement or anything like that. And that's something the broker could potentially help us figure out because it's pretty outside of our scope of work. Broker and counsel or and just you, okay. counsel, <laughs> depending on who you're negotiating with. Yeah, we do leases with uh, local agencies or public agencies or interested parties all the time. Okay. So. And can you very briefly explain what constraints we have around gift of public funds in terms of setting price? Um, so, of course, you would want to 
ha have an appraisal conducted as right. you get closer to putting it on the market. And that's what a lot of the broker's role would be here too, is to be able to provide the support and the backup and data for how much it's worth and what it should be listed for. Because um, in, in most education code statutes as a, and as a district works to, and you see them in our short-term short leasing statutes or some of our other procurement statutes that uh, fair market rent or fair market value is a requirement. Okay, so I'm just to make, to make that clear for myself and the public, if an appraisal said this property was worth $5 million, we could not sell it for $50. It would not be advisable it would, okay. to sell Okay, but I mean, we, would, we wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. There would be a, a problem with that. It, it, yeah, I mean, okay. it would be, it, it could be viewed as a gift of public funds. Okay. Yes. So I, I think that that's something we have to keep in mind, that um, it's a public property that we are not allowed to substantially um, give away, sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Um, Trustee Johnson. Another question. Uh, we listed it at a certain price. If there's an organization that wants to lease it for 99 years, can we stick with the price that we originally wanted? Um, Do we have to go through a broker? Could we go through our attorneys? Yeah, you would, you would at least need to do an appraisal for the fair market rent or fair market value component of it, just okay. to confirm that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's an option. Yes, that's an option. it is an option. Okay. So can I just, am I hearing you say that if we decided to, to do a lease, uh, once we go through this waiver, and the waiver was granted, because that's the only way we could do a lease is through this waiver at this point, mm -hmm. then we could do a lease up to 99 years, up to, but it would have to be at fair market rent. For a leasing concept. For a leasing concept. It couldn't be a dollar a year or something. It would have to be at fair market rent. Yes, there would have to be a fair market rent analysis to support uh, the where the parties land in terms of a fair market rent number. Thank you. Yeah. And then I just want to super clear because I, th I mean, and the reason we're doing this is as we all know, the community is tremendously interested in this property as they should be. And we're happy that they're tremendously interested and we want to just make sure we're getting crystal clear information. So my understanding is this waiver, we've been kind of saying the waiver allows us to, to hire a broker, but what I'm hearing you say is the waiver releases us from this formal bidding process that has been unsuccessful for us so far. Yeah. Correct. So, so our, if we don't get the waiver, we have to keep doing what hasn't worked for us. Yes. Okay. But we don't have to necessarily hire a broker. No, we're no. directly with you. No. Yes. We're released no, from yes. keep doing the same thing. Yes. Okay. Which would be a really interesting thing for someone to establish for that particular property, because it's not like doesn't look super attractive as a rental to me. So it would be interesting to see what that, that would be a fun thing to explore. Yeah. Okay, I think we got all our clarifying questions. I'm gonna do public comment and then have some board um, conversation, um, close the public hearing, and then we have a resolution before us. So um, we have four public speakers. Um, Mary Beth Kelly and Sandra Berman will be next. So Mary Beth. And we do have three minutes per speaker if you can try to stick with that. I've rehearsed this, so hopefully okay, great. I can Thank get you, it Mary in Beth. there. Let's get my readers on. All right. My name's Mary Beth Kelly. I'm a 32-year resident of Redwood Valley. I was a science teacher at Eagle Peak Middle School. I serve on the RV MAC and am the secretary of our local Grange. I'm also a proud parent and a veteran, and I'm deeply invested in the well-being of our community and its assets. Thank you, trustees, for the work you do that is volunteer. Um, I'm urging each of you to vote no on the application, which would allow for a broker to be hired and market this property, the heart of Redwood Valley, nationwide. I would ask that you instead work collaboratively with the Redwood Valley community in its efforts to transform the vacant campus into a vital community center. As stewards of our education system, I implore you to prioritize the interests of the students and the broader community in your decision-making process. I've heard from several trustees that you are in the business of educating children, not dealing with real estate. It is my firm belief that repurposing this campus into a vibrant community center aligns perfectly with Ukiah Unified's vision statement, which emphasizes the importance of collaboration, embracing change, and engaging parents and community members as partners. 
By working together, we, ha we have an op a unique opportunity to breathe new life into this vacant space and create a hub of activity that will benefit students, families, and residents of all ages. Our vision for this campus includes a rec center, playing fields and courts, community gardens, great rail trail access, possibly tiny home housing for new teachers and nurses. Yes, it is a grand vision indeed, but we know it can be done. Just yesterday I had a conversation with a well-known contractor, Eastock Menton, who told me this is an absolutely repeatable exercise that he has done in other areas, including repurposing a church in downtown Ukiah for the Community Foundation of Mendo County, repurposing an old warehouse and a former restaurant in Covalo into a public library and community center and more projects. I realize that the campus has now sat vacant for 14 years and yes, some citizens have complained about the fire hazard and eyesore it has become. I do want to remind you that when this board voted to close the school, it also promised and this is from the minutes of that time, February 9th, 2010, trustees asked to confirm the use, asked to confirm the use of the school for the community. We can maintain the campus in a park-like setting if the board chooses to ensure the facility remains in a pristine level. We have a plan that is workable and doable to keep the school in a park-like setting. This promise, of course, has not been kept. I would invite each of you to, at the very least, walk through the campus. I think that if you've been entrusted with the care of this public asset and your decisions will affect its future and the very future of Redwood Valley, that you might at least walk through the campus and the buildings before doing so. I understand that there are financial considerations and other factors to take into account when deciding the fate of this public property. However, I urge the board to prioritize the long-term benefits to this community and explore alternative solutions that would allow us to retain this valuable asset for future generations. Thank you. And I'd like to uh, give you all copies of my letter and I'd also like to uh, drop off a copy of a letter from the housing director. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I got it all there. Yeah. Thank you, Mary Beth. Thank um, you. Sandra Berman is next, and after that, um, we will welcome Sonia Pio. Hello, I'm Sandra. Thank you for having me here. I, it's my first school board meeting. I have four-year-old twin boys, so I'm really, you know, right, <laughs> right there. Um, so um, I've, I just want to say that was a really good presentation. I was learning a lot. I'm learning a lot right now about a lot of things. The Measure A, good job, everybody. <laughs> what, you know, amazing work. And I have to say, it's not really clear to me, like, what's possible now and what would be possible with this waiver. Like, right now, as it is, could you lease it, 99-year lease, to an entity that is, you know, a, a, a you know, so I, I mean, I, I, should I just answer? I just want to answer it after. She okay. I, okay. I, these these are like questions I really like. Mm -hmm. It's not clear to me, and I feel like if it's not clear, and I, I could kind of tell that we had a lot of questions. We had questions. It seemed like you guys had questions. That if that's the case, maybe we should just take a minute, take a take some time, and really make sure we've all studied. You know, I want to kind of really learn about this. You know, it's really important. So anyway. Um, yeah, we've. You, I hope you've read our emails. I've mm -hmm. gotten some really good responses from everybody. And um, Mary Beth is just, I know her from um, the Redwood Valley MAC. And I know that you guys have been dealing with this property for a long time, many different phases. And, and I want to say, you know, Redwood Valley, this is our backyard. We've gone through a lot over the past decade. I, we kind of started with Dollar General coming in wanting to move in right across from the Redwood Valley market. And we were just stunned. How can this happen? And that's what empowered us to form the Redwood Valley MAC. And Mary Beth and I were founding members of the Redwood Valley MAC. So that was, you know, quite a while, maybe over 10 years ago. Then in 2017, the Redwood Complex fire burned half of our town. So we've been kind of busy. That's why we haven't really been here <laughs> talking about the school. We've been busy with other things. Um, then the storage unit facility came in our middle of our downtown in some kind of prime commercial, you know, 
spot. And it could have, if we had maybe been involved in that process, it could have maybe worked in a kind of collaborative community way. But it just, even though we had the Mac, it still is really sad. And I worry this goes on the national market. What could happen to this incredible public asset, really? We got the chance to walk the um, campus <clears throat> arranged with, you know, with Gabe and, and a group of us who are kind of, I don't know, it's kind of synchronistic that there's things happening and we're getting together and, you know, I just think it's a huge public, I walked it, it's a big, it has a lot of potential, great bones, you know. I just think, time. give us some time, give us a minute. We really, this bigger group of us, we wanna get a bigger community meeting together. We want to present something to you at your next meeting, if possible. Kind of give you guys a clearer idea of what, what we have in mind. And I just really urge you, please, it's been how many years, like she said, it's been like 15 years or something. Why do we need to rush on this decision? I just can't, see. and it would, I think, make our community feel really good if we knew that we were, you know, you were taking our, our, you know, yeah, representing us. Yep, so thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, we have Sonia Pio and then followed by Rosemary. Good evening, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Sonia Pio. I've lived in Rounded Valley for 30 years. I have two sons that went through Redwood Valley School and Eagle Peak School. I'm also a Grange member. Um, I uh, gave 20 years of my life to Ukiah Unified as a school bus driver, and a lot of that was spent out in Redwood Valley. So I've seen these kids grow up, and now they're saying, oh, hi, you used to be my bus driver, and they're pushing a stroller. You know, it's like, wow. Um, I think Redwood Valley School has so much potential. Look what South Valley did. We can do something like that. We can hold classes, teach education, or I mean, I'm, you know, all kinds of opportunities for that. It's right along the Russian River. We can do science. The, I see the kids walking home from Eagle Peak, and it's like they just kind of look at the school and keep on trudging by. And it's, it would be such a loss for our community. The reason we live in Redwood Valley is because it's a small rural town. If we wanted to live in Santa Rosa, this is not it. Um, we have just wonderful community members that are supportive of, of each other, and um, I just hope that we can give ourselves some time and apply for the lease. Do we apply for the lease, or um, just take a, take a minute and see what we can do instead of having somebody move into Redwood Valley that's never been there. They don't know anybody there. They just want to build and make money. And that's not what we're about. So I ask all of you to think hard. What, what do you want the town to look like for your kids growing up or your grandkids growing up? So it's, it's kind of nice what we have, and I hope we can keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rosemary? Hi, Rosemary Eddy. Uh, former Ukiah Unified School District instructor, 26-year resident of Redwood Valley. Uh, prior to that, I lived in, in Ukiah for three and a half years, um, so nearly 30-year uh, county resident. Um, I feel like letters have said what I want to say. Um, bones, uh, synergy, uh, <laughs> excitement. I'm uh, also a Grange member, and... Um, I met with Mary Beth Kelly just the other day uh, in preparation for this meeting. Went to my first MAC meeting last night in preparation for this. So I, I feel myself um, uh, compelled and excited uh, about what our community can do. And we have come together uh, in times of uh, struggle and strife. Um, and we'll, we can do it again. Um, I feel it's, it's awkward and bizarre and just somehow doesn't sit well with me thinking that a family donated for $10 this property for the purpose of education. And, um, you know, when I hear the word uh, surplus, it's not surplus for us, right? It's, it's, it is a hub 
for us and our children um, and our community. And to see the gentlemen soccer players on Sunday, um, you know, that's exciting. And as as Sherilyn Evans put it, the possibilities are endless. Um, I see the the college district getting involved. There's no housing at the college, but we could have college courses. There, there are annexes in Willits and Lake County, and why can't we have a Redwood Valley uh, annex? And, you know, I, I think with the presentation potentially before you, at least an outline of the mission and the vision next month, I don't need to go there. But really, um, <laughs> revenue off of a donated property, real property. Um, my family had a 99-year lease on a, on a ca small cabin in the, in the Sierras, and we did, we did the trade because it was national forest property. Um, Redwood Valley can, can make this happen, and um, there are lots of professionals, uh, community members who are avid, uh, excited, about keeping it real in Redwood Valley. So uh, I agree, uh, what's the rush? And um, talking with Mary Beth, this is what I really wanted to say. I wanted Mary Beth to bring her binder because, <laughs> because this isn't just a coincidence that y'all are doing this now. Because you're doing this now, we're coming out of the woodwork. Mary Beth's binder is literally four, four and a half inches thick, and it reflects the work and the, and the vision. So thanks for listening. Thank you very much. And thank you, um, speakers, for um, coming today and expressing yourself. Um, so let's move, before I close the public hearing, or should I close the public hearing and then, and then the board discuss? Or how would you, like, how do I do this? Can I ask a question? There were a couple of speakers who had a couple of questions, so I don't know if you want to address those. Um, either of you, I did write them down. Well, first I was just gonna say, I, perhaps some of our wording and some of our documentation was a bit confusing that it linked this waiver with hiring a realtor and selling. That, If that was the case, that was an in, unintentional direct linkage. That's not necessarily the case, but we cannot do anything without the waiver from the state. We can't talk about leasing the property to a community group. We, can, we have no mechanism to sell or lease the property without getting this waiver approved from the state. If you approve the waiver request tonight, we can get on the agenda in September with the State Board of Education. If we don't act, we wait a couple months, it'll be the November meeting. They only meet every other month or possibly even January of 25 before we can get on their agenda for whatever that's worth. I'm not trying to put pressure or anything else, but, but we can't even have a conversation about leasing or selling the property without this waiver because we have no mechanism at this time to do anything with that property. Okay, so I, I do think, um, Superintendent Cuban, we should very explicitly answer some of those questions. So the question was, can we lease, can, could we do a 99 year lease tomorrow? And my understanding is that we cannot because we have to follow this formal bidding process, which is very rigid and it requires people submitting sealed bids, and then you have to open them publicly. I mean, yeah. we never got the opportunity because no one did a bid, but that is the process, Yes, right? that's accurate. Okay, so to me it feels like what our experts are telling us is that our flexibility in how to address this property is enhanced by a waiver. It's Correct. not constricted. I think you could say we, we can't do a lease without the waiver. We can't do anything besides the public bidding without the waiver. That's accurate, yes. So that was a question somebody had. We can't, if we don't go forward with this waiver, we couldn't even talk to the Reva Valley a group about a possible lease because we couldn't do a lease without the waiver. So, is without that, formal bidding. Without, without formal, formal bidding, bidding. Yes. okay. So, I mean, I, it sounded like surplus property, you could do a 99-year lease, but the person who was suggesting a 99-year year lease would have to go through the formal bidding process right now. Is that correct? Well, we would actually have to open another formal yes. bidding window first. Oh, yeah. First. No, I know. So, yeah, we're, we're you, so basically you have four options tonight, if I can maybe jump to that. Maybe that'll help. We can just do nothing tonight. That is an option. <laughs> okay. The board can direct administration to come back next month with another resolution to open another public bidding window. Okay. The board can direct us to bring this resolution back in a month or two or later in the year, or they can approve the resolution tonight. Those are, the, those are really the four choices that you have in front of you tonight. Okay. 
Um, but again, without, without the waiver being approved by the state or without doing another public bidding window, we have no mechanism to sell or lease or exchange the property. It's just sitting there. Okay. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to entertain comments from the board. I do have a, um, uh, I, have a I, I didn't mean to sigh in that way, but I have a statement from Trustee um, Nelson who did want me to read it at this meeting. So I think I'm going to listen to, I think we'll take some comments from the board and then I'll read Trustee Nelson's statement. So um, any comments from the board? All right. One Trustee more Johnson. question, okay. so, just so I get this clear. We can't do anything without the waiver, but that doesn't mean that if the waiver is okayed by the state, that an interested group of people couldn't approach us for a 99-year lease or a buy. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. But to go a step further, mm -hmm. somebody from the community could not come to us without the waiver and to get the 99-year lease or buy it. Correct. So if anybody from the community wanted to do a lease, or buy it, we would have to do this waiver first. Because it's state. So I think that's really important because I think that the audience was really confused about that. Yeah. They thought that the waiver was like we're working with the devil and right. we're going to have a broker and then we're going to put it out right. like nationwide. Yeah. But if we don't want to do the bidding process, which frankly we failed at twice. Yeah. And is risky. And is risky. If we don't want to do the bidding, the only other option we have is to do the waiver and then we can look at what our options are at that point, but we would have the, we would have options. Now we have bidding. Right, we have one, uh, so we could, and we have, we have been sitting on this property for 14 years, so we are not in, this has not been a, a speedy process, to, to say the least. And if we were granted the waiver, it doesn't mean we're gonna sell the property in December. It just oh. means we have the flexibility we, to we talk to entertain a bunch of different ideas. Well, we could. With an expert, I do wanna, I, I mean, I, I think the, the speaker's comment on this, I know we all feel this way, this is outside of our wheelhouse. And I would, under, I would hope that a broker, if we decided to go that direction, could enhance our ability to do this well. Or the, or the legal team. And the legal team, right. Okay, Trustee Arkin. So can I make a comment or are we doing questions or a discussion or what? You can comment. We're not gonna actually vote until I close the public hearing and open the next one, but you can, I can just talk. I yes. can whatever. Mm -hmm. So what, what I want to say is uh, all four of my children, who were adults, um, went through Calpella, Redwood Valley, and one to Eagle Peak. <laughs> because that's when it opened, the other closed. I love Redwood Valley. Redwood Valley is our place. I got, like all the rest of us, a lot of emails. I love those ideas. Those are wonderful. I, I read this, well, of course this is what we want. But we can't do it. We, we, we are not builders. We, are not, uh, we don't have the money to do that. The state would come and kick us out or something because we don't have that. But I truly appreciated hearing, uh, reading uh, all those wonderful ideas. And so it's like I... Like, I, that's just what I've been waiting for. Please come and do that. I would love a presentation of, of how it can be done, when, where, but we, if we could do it, so at least get an idea, and if we could do it next month to listen, it's just a, list, a listening and letting us know, so we are seeing what direction we can go, go in, but, but if it's a wonderful thing, we sure wouldn't want to say, oh yeah, go do everything and we don't have a waiver. So we, the most important thing is, at first when I read all those things, all those emails, I said, oh yeah, I, I'm fine with uh, putting it off. But you know, why not? Wait, at least wait till next month because they'll make a presentation. Once I realized that it would deter you from really going forward and for us to really think about it and hearing this presentation, I realized, no, no. We need to do the waiver so that we can hear what you have to say and go forward. And I know you can work hard and do it. You know, and, and yes. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, that's those are my two cents. Sandra, just so you know, we we can't do a back and forth after that. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Um, other comments from board members? Are you done, Trustee Arkin? Okay, I mean, I didn't, I was, <laughs> I was trying to shut you down. Okay, 
Any other comments? Okay, I'm going to pause and read um, Trustee Nelson's um, statement from Trustee Nelson, who is not able to be here today. He says, fellow board members, I apologize that I'll be missing the meeting this Thursday. I wanted to share my feelings with you about items D2 and D3. I feel strongly that we need to move forward with the sale of the Redwood Valley property. Below is a letter I shared with the community members who have contacted me via email, as well as the letters Debbie Ornell has forwarded. I hope you will feel compelled to vote yes on item D3, resolution number 25. And then he lists out the resolution. There will probably be many unhappy community members at the meeting. I wish I could be there to support the process. Fortunately, item D2 gives a comprehensive view of steps the board has taken. Regards, Tyler. And then I'm gonna read the letter because he referenced the letter. Dear community member, despite our efforts, there hasn't been any demonstrated and committed interest from potential buyers and the current price is reasonable. As a school district, our primary focus should be on educating children rather than engaging in property development or real estate ventures which are outside our expertise. Involving a real estate professional in this will facilitate the sale of this eyesore the Redwood Valley community has been complaining about for many years. I'm gonna pause really quickly and just remind everyone, I am reading Trustee Nelson's words. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, this is Trustee Nelson's letter. Ideally, someone from the Redwood Valley community or an outside entity will come up with a creative and realistic idea with funding to purchase the property during the sales process. This is not a fire sale. Instead, it's been a prolonged period with very little interest in the property. The pro process has taken almost 10 years to reach this point. We haven't received a single viable option from the Redwood Valley community during this prolonged time period. Taking the step to involve experts may help expedite the process and yield more fruitful outcomes. Ukiah Unified School Dis District is not a wealthy school district. I am currently advocating for our community in Washington, D.C. to increase funding. I will miss the meeting when my fellow board members take action. We cannot afford to give the property away. I hope they move swiftly to sell the Redwood Valley School property. Regards, Trustee Nelson. So again, this was a letter from Trustee Nelson. He can't vote, even though it appears he wants to. He's not able here to be here to vote, but um, he did ask me to share that. Okay, so um, at this point, if there's no more comments from the board, I will probably close the public hearing, um, and then we will take action with the next resolution. I, I do, I'm, I'm hoping, this has been an encouraging presentation for me because it actually clarified some things for me that I wasn't totally sure about. I'm really hopeful that the Redwood Valley community who I'm, is listening will be able to continue to engage to understand what um, action we've taken and how it does or does not impact them. What I'm hearing is this action doesn't actually limit us, it actually increases our flexibility. So I wasn't totally sure on that. Now I feel more sure about that. Um, I hope that we can develop a trusting relationship with the Redwood Valley community and some belief that we too want nothing more than a thriving, vibrant, useful, um, helpful, productive, in whatever form people want to think of productive, um, facility there. Even we, we really intend, do want to do that. And I do believe that the board has been going through a process always with that hope in mind, understanding that we are constrained by ed code rules and legal rules that we just don't have any control over and we have to follow. Um, I think one of, one of my learnings is that a lot of these rules were set in place so that corrupt boards did not give away valuable property to their wealthy friends. Um, that's not the situation we're in. At this point, I think we'd like a wealthy friend, but <laughs> we don't have one. So we're following rules that were not necessarily designed for what this community needs, but we still have to follow those rules. So I hope the community can, can engage in a productive, positive um, relationship with the board because we are on your side too. Um, that being said, I'm gonna close the public hearing because you're all good. Wait, what do I have to do? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Trustee Kemplinger. Sorry, I, I just wanted to say just to the members that spoke, um, I, I heard you and I appreciate all the comments, the emails. Um, I'm a Ritter Valley kid too. Um, I heard a lot of comments about, you know, no stall. I think we all, have a better understanding of what we want to see happen in Redwood Valley. Um, and I know that it's not my intentions, however this resolution goes, to just go send it, you know, try and sell it for top dollar to just anybody to come and ruin the community. It's really about letting you, you know, the community do what they can and the school district to kind of carry the commitment of releasing it back, so. Trustee Johnson. Well, you have two Valley kids on the board here. <laughs> so we heard you, and we'll do what we can to support you. 
but like we said, we have to get the waiver through before we can do that. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Public hearing is now closed, and the next agenda item is the resolution itself. Can I, can I say one more thing about, about the, the presentation that was sort of alluded to? Oh. I, I would say that there's no rush for them to, if you are gonna give a presentation, there's no rush for it to be next month because this is gonna take several months, so there's no, there's no urgency. You could take some time to get your ducks in a little more of a row before you would come back, since there's no rush. Okay. Item D3 is the resolution itself authorizing submittal of a surplus waiver application to the State Board of Education um, at, for 700 East School Way. Any comments there, or do we just go vote? I think, I think we know what to okay. do. I think we know what the <laughs> options are anyway. All right. me, so. Okay, all those in favor of this resolution? I know, sorry, can I have a motion to um, approve resolution number 25 authorizing submittal of a surplus waiver application? I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution. Motion made by Trustee Keplinger. Second. We both elicited it. Okay, seconded by Trustee Johnson. Sorry. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, community, for coming. All right. And again, I'd like to thank Serene and Tempest for being yeah, here tonight. I appreciate and that. hope they can get a plane home tonight. Yeah, so. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys. I'm going to do like a three minute break. Is it okay? Okay, five. We'll do five. So come back at five minutes. Eight twenty-three. No, eight. Eight fifty-three. Twenty-three. Whoa. <laughs>
Item D4, Personnel Commission Annual Report and Review of the 2024 Proposed Personnel Commission Budget. Hi, welcome. Push, push the button. <laughs> there uh, you go. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Okay. I hope I can know who this one. Okay. Uh, my name is Lois Lincoln, and I'm the director of the Personnel Commission. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with the Personnel Commission, allow me to give a brief um, overview. The Personnel Com Commission plays a crucial role in maintaining and advocating for the merit system. The merit system is a framework of rules and procedures designed to ensure that classified employees are selected, promoted, and retained solely on merit and fitness without favoritism or prejudice. Okay, let me see. Okay. In California, there are approximately 100 merit system school districts overseen by a personnel commission. The Personnel Commission for Ukiah Unified School District is, a, is an independent body composed of a board of commissioners. These three individuals consist of, oh sorry, yeah, these three individuals are appointed to three year staggered terms. Currently our commissioners consist of Commissioner Chair Tom Jacobson, Commissioner Pauline Rantala, and Commissioner Kathy James, who I would like to thank for her support tonight and being here. The Personnel Commission staff includes myself and Grace Chavez, who is our Personnel Specialist. The Personnel Commission meets on the last Tuesday of every month at here at the District Service Center at four o'clock. Within my report, you will notice that the um, I have highlighted the classified retirees for this period and we have six that um, have retired. And I just wanted to highlight their names because of the years that they served for Ukiah Unified, no doubt had an impact on our students and our staff. And so I think they, that, that that's great. And I would like to commit, uh, bring, sorry. I would like to just bring their names out. Sorry about that. Um, I also want to honor the 53 stu uh, employees of the month, um, the classified employees. Um, they were, it, it, I just feel like it's very uplifting that they did receive this um, rec recognition. <laughs> okay, sorry. Now I just would like to turn your attention to the recruitment for 2223. Um, we had 134 new hires, we had 10 rehires, 31 promotions, 32 transfers, and 44 substitutes. The um, graph next to this one is for, this is where we get all our applica applicants from, is from, we use two websites, hiring websites, which is Indeed and EdJoin, and so we get a significantly high volume of applicants from Indeed, as we had 1,270 compared to 129, so that's a, a lot. <laughs> um, next is our hiring trends. Here I provided some historical data to give you a better idea of how our recruitment has changed. So um, the new hires, it ha we ha show an increase from 75 to 114, and for the 2022-23, there was 134. I did list this year's, which we have 116 so far, but we do have a couple months left. And also, I wanted to bring out the substitutes. Now, in times past, we have not had a lot of substitutes. Um, people do not want to work on call, but we have seen uh, applicants come in and they would like to do on-call work and um, I think that's kind of because you know they want a flexible schedule uh, a flexible work schedule um, or you know it's a great way to get your foot in the door and so um, also I, this I want to just touch on the new hires because this is an um, this just 
comes to me like, oh, that we're changing. And I just wanted to figure out, you know, just wanted to see, well, what did we do differently to have the, the increase come in our new hires? And I believe this is a <clears throat> in connection with the way we advertise some positions and also the consistency in processing applications and contacting potential candidates. Another important factor is building and maintaining good relationships and communicating with administrators, along with ensuring interviews are conducted in a timely manner. So I kind of think that's where it's at. Um, I am happy to report tonight that we have only two classified vacancies. And so I'm really happy about that. In closing, I would just like to highlight the employee, oh, sorry, I didn't do this one. This is our classified employee barbecue from last year. And so this year, um, the barbecue, I'm sorry, the classified employee week is May 19th through the 25th. And it's a special time for us to appreciate our classified employees and all their dedication to our schools and our students. So I'd like to extend a warm invitation to all of you if you can come. We're going to be having a celebration for the classified employees on May 24th in Redwood Valley at the Lions Park, and it starts at 5.30. And so I would thank you for your consideration and hope to see you there. Thank you so much, Lois. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the board? No? <laughs> Trustee Orozco, or I'm sorry, Trustee, did, yeah. Rebecca, do you have your highlighter up? <laughs> Trustee Arkin, go ahead. Uh, what time? At 5.30. Okay. Starts at 5.30. Yes. So, Lois, I did, um, I thank you so much for this presentation, and it is mm -hmm. so nice to see um, the increase in hiring and I, that you only have two vacancies. I have been on this board now for over 10 years, and we've, in past presentations, had to spend a lot of time on, like, what are we going to do to increase recruitment, get all these positions filled, and it's it's really wonderful to see the work you've done to make that happen. So thank you so much to, you. to your staff and the commission for um, getting us where we are. It's fantastic to be fully staffed and even a bunch of substitutes. That's really wonderful. Yes. We haven't always been there. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Do I need to approve the budget? or? Okay. We need to... Do you need to present on it, or do you want us to just approve it? Oh, no, I didn't have a presentation okay. for our budget. Okay. I, I move to accept the Personnel Commission annual report and proposed budget for the 24-25 year. It was on our agenda. Yeah, it was on our agenda. So we all did see it. Yes, I saw that. Okay. okay, so we have a motion to approve the annual report and review and, and the budget. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Trustee Johnson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions? And opposed. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy James. <laughs> okay. So now we are on item D5, the revised budget framework. Steve. Yeah, this one's going to be a little interesting to try to walk through because I'm not even 100% sure what I'm All right. looking for at this point. Uh, I had a really clear idea in my head, and then we met with uh, Trustee Johnson last week to kind of prep for this and I started changing what I was thinking at that point and then three different things this week since we published this uh, happened to make me question it even a little bit more it's just kind of the world is changing a little bit on us in terms of our budget in terms of how we should be looking at things and we're trying to respond to that as quickly as we can and I think that's really part of the point of this framework you know I don't know if you can bring up the attachment for this Um, so b back at the beginning of the pandemic when we were getting flooded with all of the one-time funds with all their different spending requirements and strings and deadlines, we put together a framework that kind of helped us. It really did two things. It helped us make sure that the board knew how we were spending the money, but it gave administration the flexibility to move money around as it could as it was working on budgets because one expenditure could be paid for out of five or six different funding sources and it might have moved that many times during the course of the year just because trying to spend the most restrictive dollars first, the dollars that expire first, things like that. So it's really a, a big shell game at the end of the day, to be honest. And not wanting to have to come back to you every month with hundreds of budget changes, we were trying to get some kind of flexibility that said, yes, 
Can we make that any bigger at all? I Ian, I don't know if we can or not, but. We, we have paper copies. But so the old framework, yeah. well, I can't read it. Oh, you can't, um, okay. <laughs> so the old framework was um, we wanted to accelerate learning in person, real life learning. Remember when we did this, we were mm -hmm. just coming back to in person. That's how long ago it was. We wanted to make sure we were investing in our facilities. We got to do a lot of things with these monies, um, not just big things like some HVAC work, which helped air, indoor air quality, which was one of the prime requirements coming out of the pandemic, but a lot of outdoor furniture to get kids outside and into fresh air, um, things like that that really helped us. We had just bought all those collaborative desks where we had three or four kids all huddled together at one desk, and then the pandemic hit, and it's like, no, no, we gotta get the kids back apart for a little while. So we, we did all sorts of those things. Um, we also knew we were getting so much money. We, we, we've been doing this long enough. We know what goes up will come down eventually. The state will hit a budget uh, shortfall and we will be struggling. So we wanted to build up our reserves. And I think we did a pretty good job at that, to be honest. And then we wanted to set some funds aside for future yet to be defined needs. And those are starting to get defined on us at this point. So, so now um, I'll read some of this, hopefully not word for word, but as we near a time of greater strain on the budget, especially our unrestricted general fund, Remember, our unrestricted general fund is how we pay for most teacher salaries, most of our management, a lot of our classified employees, and all of our overhead costs. Think about what your utility bill has done at home over the last four or five years, then think about what our utility bill has done over the last four or five years. Um, it's how we pay for all of the STRS and PERS retirement costs, and we've talked several times about how those have gone through the roof. A lot of strains on the unrestricted general fund. Governor Newsom has gone back away. Governor Brown did an amazing job of consolidating all these different categorical funds and giving us just really a few buckets of money to spend. Life was actually pretty simple and pretty good. Coming from the pandemic and going forward, we're back to having all these different silos of money with different rules, different spending deadlines. Some of them are overlapping, some of them are unique. And trying to figure out how we can, again, work with the board to understand and get direction on how you want the money spent without having to come back to you every time we want to spend $500 or $5,000 out of a $19 million budget, which pot does it come from? So we're trying to find that balance. Because um, I'm, I'm trying to protect the f fiscal's time and like Katie's time. If every time we come to one of those $5,000 or $50,000 decisions and we have to stop and wait for the next board meeting, it just kind of slows things down. If you've already approved, yes, we want to spend money on outdoor furniture, do we have to then come back with that new expenditure is really kind of the questions we're trying to get to. Um, we have to spend the most restrictive dollars first. I think it was a couple meetings ago, we were talking about our reserves and talking about all these different monies and Trustee Nelson's like, well, why are, why are we, we spending unrestricted general fund dollars at all? Why aren't we spending all these other monies first? It's like, hmm, we kind of lost that thread a little bit. And that's some of the advice we've been getting this week, is that we should not be necessarily trying to save some of these one-time monies for three and four years down the road. We should be spending all of those now and saving our general fund dollars, because that's what's gonna be in trouble. Um, so again, is, it, is the board comfortable? Can the board give us direction to authorize a superintendent working with Katie and working with Christy and the fiscal team? to make budget changes and move expenditures around in these different funds as long as it still fits priorities the board has set for us? Or do we need to come back every time? Really the question kind of boils down to something like last month we brought to you about wanting more money for playoff tickets for families. And is that a conversation we wanna have or as long as we can take money from a different category that isn't hurting that category. We're not stopping doing something. We, does something cost less than we thought over here? Can we move that money over to here as we work through these budgets? Or does the board wanna be informed every single time we have one of those? And I think we're fine either way. We just wanna make sure we're giving the board the information they want without giving you so much information that you can't process at all. I mean, we could spend hours every month on, on budget if we want to, and I don't think any of us want that. Um, and again, I think we really need to prioritize building up our reserves. And we've, we haven't focused on that as much the last couple years. And that's going to get really difficult given the state's budget challenges. Um, but we have some ideas and some thoughts. And, and I think just to kind of warn all of you, we're going to talk a lot about budget the next few meetings. Um, again, as I kind of foreshadowed, the world has changed a little bit. The spending rules for ESSER 3, which is the last big pot of pandemic relief funds, have changed. They're much more flexible now. So we can do some different things that help us. Um, 
AB 218, which is the sexual molestation, is hitting our budget three different ways, and we'll talk about those. Uh, we've got to be ready to deal with that more than we are today. Um, definitely. I just think for the benefit of the cup, you have to say more than AB 2018 sexual molestation. You've got to so, keep it in just two sentences. Uh, I'm not going <laughs> to do this very well, but so the legislature opened up a window for anybody who had any sort of abuse claims any time in their lifetime could go back as far back as they had and file claims against public entities. Typically right now you can only file up to age 40, but once this, they opened this window let everybody go back, districts all over the state have gotten hammered with these lawsuits. And they are settling, they're settling for four to seven million dollars. Their court judgments are from 50 to 150 million dollars per case. We are part of self-insurance pools. We are having to help pay for other districts' settlements. And we have a couple cases of our own that we don't have, we, aren't, we weren't in the pools at that time for that. So we have to have money for those too. So it's, there's, there's a pressure looming on our budget that we hadn't anticipated even a couple months ago. Okay. Should clarify that we're talking about law, uh, things from 40 years ago. Cases from the 1960s, okay, 1970s, yes. 1980s. It's the law of unintended so gonna, consequences. Gonna, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just right. so the the bill AB whatever 218, 218 yep. opened uh, a legal process that is going to have a financial impact on our districts, regardless of what our own experience had been. Correct. Correct. Either now or in the past. Correct. And that so that we will see that impact mostly through insurance rates in the future. But but you're yes. just telling us that may happen in the We're future. We're foreshadowing. Right. Yes. But, okay. It's it's I'm saying a 10 percent reserve may not be enough. Okay. Um, is kind of the bottom line. And, and it's going to be a struggle to get back to 10% given the state's budget challenges. I, I'm in a little bit of a tough spot because we don't know what the governor's going to say on May 14th during his May revise presentation. I don't have any reason to think it's going to be great, but we do want to wait and see before we start really getting into the specifics. Um, but again, how we're viewing our budget is changing and the state budget is changing at the same time. So it's, it's going to be an interesting time. So really the question I think tonight is, how do we keep the board informed? How do we honor the direction you want to set for us while still allowing fiscal to make decisions on the fly and keep moving forward as we work through things? Um, and I think it's more of a, I mean, Deb, do you want to add anything? It, it's really looking for some direction. It's not really a formal action, I don't think, necessarily. Um, I don't think we're even looking for hard and fast rules. I think it's more guidelines and guidance, just like the original framework was, it was guidance. It wasn't hard and fast rules. Um, I think. I think we're looking for direction and action from the board. We don't have to do it at this meeting, but we did have a meeting. Um, Carolyn was there. Sorry, I missed the intro to this. Um, but um, we did, we did, uh, we, we, devo we didn't used to have a, a framework until the pandemic. And we were faced with um, uh, rapid decisions needing to be made um, and, uh, and large amounts of um, pandemic relief funds. And so it was really helpful to us um, during that time to kind of define what our focus was. Um, the board specifically said, please uh, accelerate learning in person, not through distance learning, but in person. That was just one example. And so, um, and Steve gave a good example there of number three, which is uh, if we, um, if we need more money, for example, because our kids make multiple playoff meetings and their home games, and our goal is to continue to allow our families to come in for free, um, we might need more there. Uh, we may not have spent a certain amount over here. Um, let's say that it was on, I'm gonna use substitute costs, for example, and that's already in our plan that we were gonna spend X number of dollars on substitute costs. We haven't done it. Uh, we, you know, we haven't needed as many substitutes, so we, we haven't fully expended that budget. It would be, the idea would be to be able to shift that money over toward this goal. And they're all still goals in our plans and actions in our plans, um, but it might be necessary to use a, uh, you know, a, a shift money. But still keep with the same goals and actions. Yeah, I guess maybe just add one more comment. I, I feel like once we had this initial framework, we felt like we knew when we needed to come to you with decisions and when we could move forward. And I think right now, we don't have that clarity. And so I think we're just trying to get that. Um, and that's really vague and hard to pin down, I understand. So I'm asking for a lot probably. But uh, just right now, it is a little confusing. 
should this go to the board? Well, the board's already approved this. Yeah, but they approved it with this fund, not this fund. It's that kind of so confusion. I, I think we can help on that, on getting some clarity tonight, and I think this is a good start. So, um, Trustee Johnson? I think what I'm, uh, what I'm hearing and what I heard at our, <clears throat> excuse me, our last budget meeting is that you're asking for some trust from the board to be able to move monies from one pile to the next without having to come to the board with every financial decision as long as it's within our goals and objectives that we set as board members. Is that correct? I, I just I wouldn't use the word trust because I do feel like we I think the board has been amazing in supporting us and trusting us with the decisions we've made. I, so it's not quite trust; it's the room to make those decisions. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll change the word a little bit. Yeah, I, I think the wiggle that, room. Yeah. Uh, okay. I uh, other thoughts from the board? Well, well, my feelings are that I generally have. Um, uh, felt good about the decisions that you have made and that they've um, they've been in the right direction. Now, every once in a while, we want to shift something, but it seems to be still within the realm of what we, w the direction we want to go, and that you are flexible enough to know, and I think you know enough about how we feel and Many a time I have heard, oh, wait till Tyler finds out about this, <laughs> or is that, so that you kind of know, know, or <laughs> Megan, she's also real good with that, and uh, so I'm comfortable with that. I, I don't, th I don't think you guys are gonna have a field day, only because we don't have enough to have a field day. <laughs> but uh, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think the intent is as long as it's things that you've already. These are already part of board approved plans or direction you've given us. If we wanted to go off and buy a projector for every kid to take home out of some of these monies, we would come back and talk to you about that first because we've never talked about that. So that's an example of where we would not just go do something. I, um, okay, other thoughts from the board before I share mine? I, I, um, I like clarity, I like frameworks. I, I probably should have been in this meeting. So um, I, I think I'm, I'm not super comfortable. One of the main things we do is approve budgets. Like, that's supposed to be our power. So kind of preemptively ceding that power to me feels a little bit like something we should take seriously. Um, and I know we are taking it seriously, but it's something that I'm thinking about for, again, I, away from the trust concept, but making choices about how money is spent is firmly within the authority of the board. Um, I feel totally comfortable with switching around the funding source. I think that, that, that to me, I, I do not feel like you need to come to the board for. In the language here, it says to make budget changes. There's no dollar amount cap on that. So to me, I'm hearing we are preemptively giving the authority to, away from ourselves, that if there was a $400,000 difference in, in what you wanted, but it was in, within the theme of what we approved, you could do that. And my concern is you do that because you think you have the framework for it. Later on, you, you report on it and we're like, what did you do? And you're gonna be like, but we had this framework. And we're like, but we didn't know you meant that. So I just think that there's a little bit of a danger there unless the clarity is very clear because you want some clarity. Please. So I would be more interested in a cap in that, you know, up to, and we can decide what it is. This is a large budget. So, I mean, I prop, I don't know, I was gonna just throw out $100,000, but that sounds really high to me, something like that. So I'm saying like, if it's within $100,000, or we should decide on what the dollar amount is. Carry on, as long as it's within the vision of what the, had already been approved, and let us know, kind of a friendly FYI, but um, I, I'm not comfortable without some kind of container for you, which is, I think, what you're looking for. So when I see the language, authorize the superintendent in consultation with blah, 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 to make budget changes, that's very broad, and that's just giving away our authority which I don't okay. think we should do as a board without a really clear container on it. And one of the last things I want to do is be standing up here giving a budget presentation and have you be surprised. That, that's not a good place that's for, not for in your me best to be or, or, right, or yours. Exactly. Right, that's not what we want. That's not the communication you, we want. You want, and I think you need, and I agree with um, not being slowed down, um, being able to make decisions that are rational, that, that are already within there, and not being worried or feeling like you have to come talk to us about $5,000. Right. Like that, that is not efficient. So 
I, I, I could work on this language. I mean, we can do this right now. There's, there's some ways I think we could change this language that might give you what you needed and, and would make me more comfortable. But Trustee Fernandez, and then I'll go to Johnson. I, I mean, I, I do agree with you, because there was an example, and I can't remember what it was, at one point where we were surprised by something. We're like, whoa, what's this expenditure? I don't remember this. And it was like, oh, well, you approved it as part of this or something. I don't remember the details, but we were like, oh, OK, we, we must have. And it felt a little like um, mm -hmm. unclear, maybe. So Ho hopefully I, it was a small expenditure, not it, a big it one. It wasn't but. significant. I don't okay. remember what it was for, but I just remember the surprise of feeling like we weren't aware of it. So I, I agree with you. I think changing the funding source for the same amounts, you know, if we, if we approve $20,000 or $50,000 for X and we were going to get out of this funding source, but now you want to use some other one, I don't think that needs to come to us at all. I think the switcheroos you do to meet your deadlines <laughs> is totally fine. But I do agree that it would be nice to have a cap so that we weren't surprised or feel like we were not, we were like asleep on the job or something. Right. Kind of yeah. like the way, and when we do have like the, those contracts, you know, those that we, uh, authorized uh, contracts up to a certain dollar amount. So right. we have yeah, a that we don't that. that we see after the fact that are not, not a big deal. I, I, I like the idea of a, of a, of an amount. I'm not sure what that would be, but. Um, do you know what other districts do in like a pre-authorization kind of concept? I don't. I think every district's probably dealing with this very differently because it's it's we've never been through some of this stuff before, and the next two years are going to be a time we've never dealt with before. Um, so we're we're trying to figure it out as we go. <laughs> okay, I don't know what I don't know what a responsible dollar amount is. Do you? Oh, okay. You don't. Okay, <laughs> you have a question first. And, and Megan, that that was the impression I got was that they wanted to be able to m move some of those funds around. Um, I don't think we ever talked about a cap amount. It was just the idea of them being able to take from one fund, pay with another one, so they didn't have to keep coming back to us every time they had to make an expenditure. I'm all right with a capped amount, but I have no idea what that would be. Right. I think, so I, I saw them as two different things. Switching funds, I actually don't care if there's a capped amount or not, honestly. I mean, if, because for we, we for approved expenditure, we said okay. go buy $200,000 worth of library books from the general fund, and you're like, wait a second, I can use ESSER. Please do, okay. you know? So that, and f swap it back to the general fund. So that, to me, is just giving you the ability to do your job. Okay. Um, that, to me, is separate from we were going to spend twenty thousand dollars on library books, but now we want to spend two million dollars on library books. And since we'd said library books were okay, I'm going to do that now. And that's where I, I I don't think it's very protective for you without us giving you a dollar because I I remember all you come to us with some expense, and we were like, what is this? And it was like a sewing machine for ten thousand dollars or something. And I was like. It was the eye, the eye machine. Something very yeah. small. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, please buy your vision machine, right? right. So right. so I don't want you to have to do that either. That's slowing down the vision machine purchase. Mm -hmm. So um, I just, I don't know what an appropriate dollar amount is. I, I know, I mean, I, I, I work in the county system and there's like the de department director can make contract decisions up to a certain amount. I feel like it was $50,000. It's a different kind of thing. So maybe, I don't want to prolong this, but if this language needs work, you might come back with a suggested dollar amount. Okay. Is sure. that? Yeah. That's, is that's that, fine. Is this dragging this out for you all? Yeah. So and the and other we, and maybe separate the two. Yes. Yes. Separate yes. The two. Yeah. Yeah. yes. So authorization to we would. I'm happy to authorize moving expenditures between and among, and then a separate line authorize the superintendent to make new expenditures up to a certain dollar amount as long as they're still within the the approved plan. Does that right. make sense? And I would also add to there is and also as long as we're not cutting something else. Right. You know, that that like, you know, we're right. not gonna spend a hundred thousand dollars. I'm gonna use your number, hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> we're not gonna increase something to a hundred thousand dollars and then cut library books here. No, that because, you had already approved because right. that's like a change in intent. But if you had something like we had we, we had had over budgeted uh, right. and we have savings here and this for, let's gate use the example. Piece. Gate fees mm -hmm. is turning out to be more. You can do what you want up to a certain dollar amount. Right. That that would so be that would be really helpful. Yep, yeah. It would be. Okay. That would be yep. really helpful. The other thing I just on the, on your four bullet points here, um, the one that caught my eye a little bit is is number four, is kind of a policy decision that if we meet once we meet our ten percent reserve, 
we would invest in our facilities. So that that is the board saying that is the primary goal once we, I mean, I don't know if we're all on board with that, so. I don't know, the, do we even need to have that because we're so, aren't we so far from meeting our 10% <laughs> reserves? That, that's sort of pie in the sky there? Um, it, it's going to take a little while to get there, and I, it's, it's not just to get there, but it's to be stable at 10%. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get to 10% knowing I'm going to drop down to four the next year and say, oh, let's put a bunch of money away for facilities. That doesn't that, serve that us well. That to me doesn't yeah. feel necessary. It doesn't okay. to me either, because also I don't, I mean, this might take five years, and in five years we may not want, I mean, facilities may not we do want to invest in facilities, Gabe. I mean, you're probably giving me stink eye over there, but we, we might have some other need. That the state might give us the money they owe us in the next five years. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right, I know, but yeah. wishful thinking. <laughs> I, I like that goal. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that for the 10%. Yeah. No, to meet the 10%. The goal, yeah. the goal of, of making sure that our primary goal is to rebuild up to the 10%, yeah. I'm fine with. But once we meet that, preemptively deciding our priorities for facilities seems a little jumping the gun to me. Okay. Yes. We're fine coming yeah. back and saying, hey, right. great news. We've got 15% reserves. Where do you want this five to go? And that, that's a great conversation to I, have. Yeah. I think that's more appropriate. Perfect. Okay. okay. Good. Okay, any other comments here? So it sounds like we're, when I look at the bullet points, first one's fine, second one's fine, fourth one we're getting rid of, yep. third one needs to be separated into two. Yes. Perfect. With the uh, authorization to move expenditures without a dollar cap, a clarity on a dollar cap. To instead. increase and decrease approved budget line items. We, yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Is that so Thank, you, thanks you for explaining little, what I wanted. Okay, you, were a little, <laughs> you were a little waffly in the beginning, and I was thinking yeah. you didn't want this at all. Do you, are you sure you want it? Yes, but you I sure? think we're going to be coming to you with some other stuff, too. It's, it's going to be a busy couple months, like it's I said. Good. Okay, so uh, I would say if you think that this is going to be restrictive and not helpful, then no, let this, us No, this definitely. Okay. I, think, I think for Katie and Christy, as we're sitting there going through stuff, which they do almost every day, it seems like at this point, this is extremely helpful, so thank you. Okay. Oh, so we're not taking action. We gave direction. We're not taking we'll action yet. Okay. All right. So we have um, a string of resolutions in, in um, appre appreciation of our classified employees, our teachers, and our school bus drivers. Frankie, do you want to share that? All right. Um, so we have a resolution, number 15, uh, to recognize our classified employees for the week of May 19th through May 21st, 25th. Um, so the classified service uh, for the Ukiah Unified School District is really the engine that makes us move. They are the first line employees that help students, that support our parents, that support our community, and support our employees within the district, especially our administrators. So it's really important um, that we recognize their service uh, the recommended motion today is that you approve resolution number 15 and honor our classified service. We also ask that our public, our students, our community, and our parents additionally uh, recognize the classified service in their day-to-day -day work here for Ukiah Unified. Okay, wonderful. Can I have a motion to approve the resolution celebrating and appreciating our classified employees? I move that recognition with great gratitude. I second it. Motion um, pass, uh, Motion made by Trustee Fernandez, seconded by Trustee Orozco. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And any abstentions? Well, we are delighted to appreciate and um, support our classified employees. Thank you. Thank you. And you're carrying on to the next one? Yeah. Okay. So resolution number 20 is a proclamation to recognize teachers. Uh, this is a teacher recognition day, uh, and this is uh, going to be May 8th. Uh, so teachers, in my opinion, are first responders. They're mm -hmm. sometimes left out of that category. Uh, as we all witnessed through the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, they were our, our first responders supporting kids as they were in their homes trying to learn on a daily basis. Uh, our teachers have been tasked with social emotional learning more than ever in their careers since returning from the pandemic. Uh, so the recommended motion is that the Board of Trustees um, approved motion uh, resolution number 20 uh, to, pro to proclaim that Wednesday, May 8th is the day of the teacher. And we also encourage parents, students, and the community uh, to also recognize our teaching staff. Okay, wonderful. Can I have a motion to um, approve resolution number 20, celebrating the California Day of the Teacher on May 8th? Because I love the teachers, I would love to make a motion to, for resolution number 20. 
Okay, motion made by Trustee Keplinger. Seconded by Trustee Johnson in celebration and um, gratitude for our teachers. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstentions and opposed. Thank you so much. Okay, carry on, Frankie. Okay. Let's go. Okay, so for resolution number 21, I'd like to call up Gabe. Oh, um, our school. You know, to recognize our school bus drivers. Great. Thank you, Frankie. Yeah. Okay, I could talk a while about this, but um, I know it's been a late night, so instead of talking broad, I'm gonna actually share an, uh, an anecdote from today. So I had the great joy, my wife and I, of uh, attending or joining the Grace Hudson fifth grade on their field trip to the Exploratorium today. Mm. Great time. <laughs> um, and as we ventured south in our little white minivan with a couple other Grace, Grace Hudson parents in it, um, one of our bus drivers had 60 Grace Hudson students and um, you know, we drove through the Embarcadero in the, mm. in the minivan, and it's been a while since I've been in the city driving that vehicle. And it was, you know, it was good. <laughs> we did it. There was a little white knuckle. And, but watching that school bus go, pure confidence. You know, my wife said, is, are, is this okay? And it's like, they got it. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what an opportunity for our kids to drive in that safety as we were there. There were a couple tour buses that showed up and some other, you know, uh, other schools got out. The personalization there, you know, the, you know, the driver got him out, got up, took off. You know, our school bus driver made sure everyone had their bag stowed, went over the rules, safe, efficient, and just loving. Um, so yeah, that's that was my my little spiel, and that's every day. You know, home to school, they know the kids' names, the kids know their their names, they care, and we're doing so much good work at this point, and it's really they're the they're the tip of the spear on that. So. Anyway, thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so this resolution is recognizing School Bus Drivers Day on April 23rd. Yes, so the recommended motion is to approve resolution number 21 uh, to recognize our bus drivers on April 23rd. I don't remember there being a School Bus Drivers Day in the past. I don't either. There has been? Yes, Maybe there we has. forgot to recognize I, it. I so move. Yes. Let's yes. Move. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> motion made by Trustee Arkin. I second it. Seconded by Trustee Fernandez with great gratitude and appreciation for our school bus drivers. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Or abstentions? Great. Wonderful to honor our school bus drivers. Yeah. They're awesome. Thank you. Okay, the next resolution is not as exciting, but is that for you too? Actually, this is exciting. Oh, it's exciting? Yeah, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, and okay. I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. Okay. So resolution number 24 um, is a resolution for waiver of the 180-day service requirement uh, for our retirees to come back and provide service to our community and to our students. And so we took our early retiree notification employees. Uh, so Ms. Christina Burrell, who is a principal of ours over at Calpella, She'll be coming back next school year to provide mentoring and coaching to our new administrator hires. Uh, she'll be also assisting in support for professional development, coaching PLCs, providing assistance for administration of the schools that are in CSI, TSI, and ATSI. Um, so she'll also assist with curriculum instruction, um, developing systems and structures at schools pertaining to school discipline, parent communication, curriculum alignment uh, with standards, um, great and grade level work identification. Um, our next employee is Robin Anderson over at Yokeo. She'll come back for us and provide mentoring to new teachers, provide intervention and support services, and curriculum development and professional development. The same goes for Jan Fairbairn, a retiree from Yokeo. Uh, she'll do the same type of work. And then last but not least, Julie Murray, a teacher from Calpella, will come back and do that same type of work. All right. Yeah, so it's always great to have retirees that come back to the district. Um, you know, they know the policies, they know um, how to work with students, and they can coach and help build our workforce moving forward. Wonderful. Well, we are lucky to have them back after yeah. they um, retired, so I'm happy to entertain a motion for this resolution number 24. Thank you, Trustee Johnson. Is there a second? second. Thank you, Trustee Kreplinger. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And abstentions. Okay, thank you. We are moving on to our last substantive item of the evening. Item E1, the strategic plan, local control accountability plan input. Thank you, Katie. Yes, we are very excited to be here. We've been here a lot this year. Um, <laughs> we started this process back in August 
to develop our new three-year plan. Um, we had a tremendous amount of stakeholder engagement, and um, you've seen this plan multiple times, drafts of it, um, have had opportunity to give input into it. Um, you approved the positions that we're proposing in February, and um, we wanted to share with you, and I'll, let, I'll turn it over to Katie in a second. We wanted to share with you, um, we've been out getting more input, um, and we wanted to share with you that input. It's in a grid attached to this. Um, and I'll just say it's a pure joy um, engaging our, our partners in uh, what, what, what they think about this plan, what else might be helpful. Um, we probably got input from maybe like 80 to 100 of our students. So we um, consulted with our South Valley students. Um, our two leadership classes at Ukiah High School, our um, Title VI Native American Club, um, and our uh, Club Latino at the high school. And um, they are so full of wonderful ideas. Um, so anyway, that is there for you. Um, we also have our, and then our draft um, strategic plan LCAP um, framework and the action plan. We did add one thing to the action plan, and that was grant writing. Um, we usually allocate about $10,000 a year for grant writing. It has gained us, um, I'll just use our, our, um, our counseling grant. I, that gained us how many million dollars, Katie? I can't think of it off. Four. Yes, so a uh, very small expenditure t for us to be able to pursue grants. Um, so that's really the only new thing that's on here, I think, since the last you've seen it, but I want to turn things over to Katie. Um, the only new thing, as uh, Superintendent Cuban noted, is that we added the grant writing. We highlighted that in yellow, both on the budget spreadsheet and in the plan. New, though, is the budget spreadsheet. We hadn't shared that yet. We were still working on that. And I do want to just point out a few things on the budget spreadsheet. Um, we're trying to reorganize our budget spreadsheet to match the new strategic plan. So we had to spend some time doing that. It's organized by priority. Um, and you can see that we have the estimated cost for going three years out. Um, for our strategic plan. We know we'll have to make some adjustments as those years come up, but we do estimate out um, three years when we're looking at the strategic plan. When we bring the local control accountability plan, it will only have one year. The uh, iteration of the local control accountability plan the about three years ago used to have three years on it. And it we've changed. It, it's well. changed, and we feel like it's good, though, to have the three years in the strategic plan as well, because it's still a three-year plan. Um, the We also wanted to point out on the very last page, on page four, um, we have two estimates of revenue right now. Um, as uh, Steve Berkman pointed out, there's a lot of change kind of happening with the budget. Um, the first part, um, the first um, top part of the graph there, of the chart, sorry, um, is showing you what the estimated colas were going to be um, when we did second interim. Um, and so what you can see in yellow is that these are amounts that we have that if those same colas came in, we think we would still have that amount of money to figure out what we want to do next in the plan and allocate. When we go down to the second chart, that's actually a 0% COLA because the legislative analyst's office was also saying, well, it could be a zero COLA. So just to kind of give an idea of what the funding looks like, in the first year we still have some funding that we need to allocate a little bit in the second year, but in the third year we would have a deficit if the COLAs stay at zero. Um, so just to kind of give an update on that to know that it's still a little unclear what that would look like, um, and we would have to do some reductions there. But we're really excited that we can do all the things that we've planned so far. Um, we, as Superintendent Cuban said, we did a lot of stakeholder or of educational partner engagement, um, and we met with a lot of student groups um, 
and we have tried to organize that input. It's a lot of input, and we recognize that. We even combined input, you know, around a theme. Um, and so we're really processing that right now, and we wanted to share that with you. Um, some of the theme, themes that did emerge, there was a lot of support for, um, if possible, uh, continuing um, to support more bilingual paraprofessionals. Um, there was a lot of input on, you know, we're getting more, it, we, we've looked at the numbers a little bit. It's a little hard sometimes to analyze, but we have a lot of new students that um, are learning English. Um, and that came actually from our Club Latino as well yesterday when, or was that yesterday? Yeah, that was yesterday that we met uh, with those students. Um, that it's very helpful for them to have someone, that, especially when they're first here. Um, we also got a lot of input from students around, um, we, we tried to ask the questions around belonging, that um, priority around sense of belonging and wanting to come to school. So uh, we got a lot of input around that um, and a lot of input around peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, whether that be there were ideas around could we have a student activity center uh, where, I, and I loved it, where we could hang out and actually talk to each other and could we have vending machines there? <laughs> um, so a lot on peer-to-peer, -peer, a lot um, on that extracurriculars were really important. Multiple groups of students said, you know, these extracurriculars are important. The support that, that um, clubs um, could potentially have um, because of some of the guidelines around food, they're worried about fundraising. So that was some input, like could we have more support for that or maybe some base funding. Um, other things uh, around um, sense of belonging were also, um, one that was really interesting was, hey, when a, you know, teacher's attitudes, when they come, when they're enthusiastic about what we're learning, that really helps us. Um, and when they talk about like, hey, the first time I had my job or my first apartment, you know, really bringing it into uh, connecting to them, but also being very relevant to students. So I just wanted to highlight that because I thought that was really interesting. Um, so those were some of the highlights. A lot um, uh, support for looking at grading practices and teaching and especially around engagement in the classroom and changing things up and can we have you know different ways of teaching. So um, there was a lot of input on that um, from students and we just did all the students so I'm kind of highlighting a lot of the student input, not all the students but um, groups. Um, other input um, was also to continue cultural awareness training um, for Native American cultures and Latino cultures, so that was came up in a couple different groups, um, and we do have um, some funding for that in the plan in our in our professional development. Um, Katie, I also want to yeah. point out um, uh, there's a desire among um, staff to learn more about um, strategies to support English learners in the classroom. You can see that that was identified by multiple um, groups on page two. Um, so, how to support ELs with academics, ongoing training, training for staff on how to work with special education students, so special populations of students yeah. um, came up in terms of um, staff members wanting more training. Kind of goes with the theme there of um, supporting our students who are learning English and who have special needs. Okay, are you ready for board comments? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, let's let's um, let me parse this out a little bit. Are there any? Uh, actually, you know, do what you want. And um, <laughs> board comments on any of the topics that Katie covered here. Um, I I did a qu I had a question about the on the budget sheet, mm -hmm. um, and I. This just caught my attention, so I, I don't normally notice one number. But on priority 1.3, additional professional development for math, letters, differentiation, blah, blah, blah. It's the last one right there. Why does it jump up from 76,000 to 360 in that third year? Um, 
kind of back to our budget framework question, we have educator effectiveness funding that we're gonna be bringing a plan to you. So we have quite a bit of monies to help support letters and some of those other trainings. Um, that funding is to specifically help support um, cultural awareness training. Um, so, and then it increases because in two years out, the educa educator effectiveness spending timeline ends and we won't be able to use those funds anymore. So that's an example where it's smaller and then it gets bigger. Okay, so so the actual costs are like $360,000 a year, but we only need to use 76,000 because we have these other funds in these first two Correct, okay. yeah, and well, I we haven't worked on the exact cost and we'll be bringing a plan to you to, with more um, estimated okay. expenditures for educator effectiveness. Okay. Yeah. Other thoughts or comments from the board? I have a question. The administrative so just like our teachers have to clear their credentials, oh, okay. so do our administrators. Right. And so we pay for the BITSA program for our teachers. Mm -hmm. It's not called BITSA anymore, is it? It's called it's in, CTIP. Yes. California okay. Teacher Sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And then um, so we also pay for that for our administrators. Um, we do get agreement from them that they will stay with us for a certain number of years or else they have to pay the district back. So um, anyway, that's where people like Tina Burrell, who's going to be a retired principal, she'd come in and help with that coach. It's all a coaching process that helps them um, clear their administrative credentials. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, is, is this the last time we're, we're looking at this? No, no we're going to okay. bring back in May and then also for final approval and for the public hearing in June and then final approval in June. Okay. I feel like it's, it's a little late to the party, but um, I, I do, you know, we spent time on a sports workshop and we talked about having a sports committee or I can't remember exactly what we were calling it. it to me, it, it would make sense to note that in a strategic plan as, as one of the, the, just to keep it on the radar, it means you would be reporting on it, there would be momentum around it. It feels like it fits in section four to me on cultivating a district-wide safe, positive, and healthy climate and culture for students, teachers, and support staff. I just, I mean, just to note that our sports program is such an enormous part of our culture, it, it feels absent <laughs> if we don't have it in the strategic plan as well. Okay, great. Yeah, and we, um, we, ha we have some lines in there that support sports. So, so you, could, you could we can put them. it in there, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So that, that would be my only comment. Others? Looks like we're good. Okay, are you looking for action from us today? We don't need any action. If there was any other direction or input that you had, we would love to hear that from you tonight. I think probably what we'll be really looking at, um, if there's no other board input, is looking at... Um, bilingual paraprofessionals. We have a little bit of money in here to be able to allocate, so that might be something that we'll look at. It came up multiple times from stakeholder groups. I mean, but it's not would, in the plan right now. That but would, it would come be. back to you as a draft to the next meeting, so there's still time okay. to percolate. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. All right, so we're at superintendent's report. You actually caught me speechless. You know what I was <laughs> no, okay. I'm just kidding. No, it was just super nice seeing our South Valley kids. Um, two of those kiddos are on the superintendent student advisory committee. We will. I will be bringing those kids to the May board meeting. Um, I'm working with them to create a presentation to the board on the student survey data, which can help your thinking on some of this work as well. Um, so it's just our kids are super articulate. Um, they're about to graduate, and uh, it's it's been it's just really good to um, see the good work that they're doing there. Um, I will I will also say one more positive thing: our attendance is up, and I'm so happy. I know I've said that before, but this month um, I think we were up six percent over last year. That's awesome. So year, month after month, our attendance has been up anywhere between like 0.96 of a percent all the way up to 6%. So um, we haven't had the W like we had last year with, you know, dips throughout the year. So um, I'm going to knock on the, mm -hmm. the table here and just really thank our community and our kids for really um, getting, getting back into the routine of getting to school. And that, of course, will help their learning, which is great. So I think that's all I'll say.
Great, wonderful. Um, board members? Trustee Keplinger? Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the um, schools and the administrators for the spring break opportunity. Um, I don't have a kiddo that went, but I had a kiddo that worked there and she had an amazing week. She loved every part of it, the activities and the different um, focus for the week. She, I mean, we were getting blasted with videos and photos and everything that they did and she came back nightly just really happy. Tired, but really happy, so. And she got paid. Yeah. And she got paid too, but, awesome. But I appreciate that that was an opportunity for, for our students to attend. And it sounds like, at, at least at that site, everybody absolutely loved it. So thank you again for doing that. Great, thank you. That's awesome. Um, Trustee Fernandez? Um, I wanted to thank Trustee Nelson for um, going to DC on our behalf and advocating mm -hmm. for our district and our, our students. I um, appreciate that. I'm sure it was a real hardship as well for him. Um, I also, I am interested in adding language to our board policy, our our temporary coaching board policy to include what our hiring process is because um, the info from our board workshop isn't actually what the practice is at the high school and in my opinion a clearly articulated process in our board policy would provide transparency to everyone in our community which includes potential coaches and current coaches and families everyone I don't think that it's in our best interest it's in, not in anyone's best interest to um, have a process that is dependent on who the current AD is or who the current principal is or who the current HR staff is. I think that if we had a policy in our, uh, if we had a, our board policy included what our hiring process is, I think it would provide clarity for our community, which I think is really important. So I'm, I'm interested in seeing that. So this is the board policy on temporary athletic coaching. Or is it on hiring, or is it I think both? it's all, it's, I think it's one policy, right? We don't, it does, it's silent on the, when I looked on at the it, it was process. silent on the hiring process, mm -hmm. which I think creates confusion. Okay. So let's, um, so for the, so let's, the request is to bring back the board policy on temporary athletic coaches, which I think is the title of the board policy. I think it is, with what our practice, what our practice is, yeah. or should be, and if, it, if it's what it should be, then that I would like to see it's what our high school is doing. So I'd like it to align. <laughs> okay, no so let's start with the clarity and then, <laughs> so with, a, with including language related to the hiring practice. Process. The process. Hiring process for temporary athletic coaches. Whatever it is, let's have it be clear. Okay. Um, is, is that okay with you, Superintendent Kubik? Yeah. Okay. Um, Pardon? No, it would become here, oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay, no, yeah, no, have it come to us to review. Come to us to review. Yeah. yeah. It would probably come because you're asking for the detail of hiring. It'll probably come in an administrative regulation. Okay. The policy is sort of like the overarching philosophy behind something, and then we put the detail in an AR. But I'll look at that. We don't approve ARs, do we? Um, some you do, some you don't, but you've requested that it come to you, so we'll make sure that it comes to you. I just think it would benefit our community if we had consistency and clarity in what we what we do. Okay, so that, I mean, we have a process for re reviewing and approving policies and regulations, yeah. so we'll just follow that process. Yeah. Okay, all right, any other requests from the board or reports? Looks like we're not, so we're gonna move to student expulsions, readmissions. Sorry, I had to rewrite that, okay. Do you want me to say it? Okay, so this is to extend um, the expulsion for student AA 0411-2024 through June 2024. Um, and there would be a motion for that. Okay, can I have a motion to extend the expulsion for student AA-04-11-2024 through June 2024? I so moved. Moved by Trustee Johnson. I'll second it. Seconded by Trustee Fernandez, all those in favor? All right. I, I, okay. 
you know, abstentions or oppositions. That one's easy. So we're also, um, I'm looking for a motion to expel student 01-04-11, 2024, for spring and fall semester of 2024. I so move. Moved by Trustee Arkin. I second it. Seconded by Trustee Orozco. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed and abstentions, okay. And we have one more. It's a, I'm looking for a motion to expel student 02-04-11, 2024 for spring and fall semester of 2024 and to suspend the expulsion for fall 2024. I have a motion to do so. Moved by Trustee um, Kaplinger. Seconded by Trustee Johnson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And abstentions? Okay. Thank you. And now we've already approved the consent agenda, so we are ready to schedule um, agenda planning, which looks like it's, you gave me this piece of paper, so let me find it. Um, so it looks like we're scheduling, we're hoping to schedule agenda planning for May 1st. Um, B, you're on deck. And Rebecca, you're also on deck. To, is that, are you available? Okay, so it's May 1st, usually at lunchtime, right? At noon. And I'm sorry, I didn't check my calendar, so I'm gonna do that really fast. Um, let's just assume it's okay. So May 1st at, at noon. And Can I, can I also just note that we, in our consent, uh, for those of you who write it down, we did move our December board meeting yes. from the 12th to the 19th. Okay, so people note that for That's folks. In, that in your calendars. In your calendars, a December meeting moved from the 12th to the 19th for a complicated, not interesting reason. Um, <laughs> and then just a reminder of the board that we do have a governance workshop on Monday at five? I don't even remember. At five. five at five, five o'clock on the 15th, on the yes. 15th which is Monday. Five to seven. Mm. Governance and workshop. Then you should have studied your, your own books. strengths, mm -hmm. taken the quiz. So bring your iPad mm -hmm. and your your book. Oh, your iPad? Bring your iPad, please. And the book. And the little book. And then you wanted something else. If, if you brought the, if you have the results, that would be good so you remember what your strengths are. We'll send something out mm -hmm. tomorrow. Yes, okay. but please bring your iPad because there's an activity that we're going to be doing, not with the Strengths Finder, but something else that is really fun. Can I ask a question, not to throw a wrinkle into this agenda planning thing, but May 1st is Senior Signing Day at the high school. Um, it got moved? Okay, great. Thank you. Never mind. Okay. Oh, I know they did, but... Um, I think it's still nationwide May 1st. So anyway, I was just thinking maybe we could move it to 1130. So I, d I worked with like 22 kids on their college applications. It would be really fun to be able to be up there with them. But um, Wait, so is it, do we want to I don't it? know. Steve thinks maybe they changed the date. There's an event at the high school that Deb wants to be able to attend, so we may have changed the May 1st agenda planning. We might just sure. flip it but up. But wouldn't that be at 11.50? Is this? It's a Wednesday, and lunch oh, on Wednesday lunch. is at 12.30. Mm -hmm. is, there, is this the one that's been thrown out as well? No. Oh, it's another one? So anyway, we'll get back to you on that. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Are we ready to adjourn? May I have a motion to adjourn? Thank you, great. Okay, let's adjourn. Thank you.